This episode of Gather and Go is brought to you by Visit Atlantic City. Live to explore in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Atlantic City welcomes one and all to the seaside destination where local spirits are connected and the celebrations are unforgettable. Learn more at visitatlanticcity.com. Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to Gather and Go, the podcast that helps you plan, promote, and lead better trips. I am your host, Brian Jewell. I am so excited that you decided to spend some time with us today on this first day of spring. And as always, our promise to you is that we're going to do everything we can to make that investment of your time worth your while. Now, today I'm going to bring you a really, really interesting conversation with Jeremy Sampson of the Travel Foundation. Jeremy is one of the leaders in talking about climate and climate action from a tourism point of view. And I guarantee you the things he has to say are going to be unlike anything else that you hear anybody else in the climate space or in the tourism space talking about. This is a really important conversation, a really encouraging conversation. I can't wait for you to hear it. First, though, let's get into some travel news you may have missed. U.S.-based airlines are beginning to resume service to Israel. Prior to the October 7th terror attacks in Israel, all three major U.S. carriers offered multiple weekly or daily flights to Israel. However, they all suspended service soon after the terror attacks and the start of the war in Gaza. Now, though, two U.S. carriers are in the process of resuming Israel service. United Airlines resumed daily flights from Newark, New Jersey to Tel Aviv on March 6th. Delta Airlines has announced plans to restart flights from New York JFK to Tel Aviv on June 7th. That will leave only American Airlines without service to Israel. American has indicated that it won't resume flights to the region until later this fall. United and Delta are joining a number of international carriers to resume flying to Israel. Those include Lufthansa and Air France, which restarted flights in January, and British Airways, which will return to Israel on April 1st. Now, many of these airlines plan to operate scaled back schedules of flights to Israel for the time being, as visitor interest in traveling to the area remains at a fraction of what it was before the war began. Well, now it's time for the road tip segment of our show. This is the part of every episode where we dig deep into our bag of travel knowledge and share some tips from our time on the road that we think will help you make your next trip less stressful and more successful. Now, I can't tell you how many times I have been on a trip on a motor coach and had a snack or a drink, because let's face it, we all love snacks and drinks on the road. So I have a snack, I have a drink, and I'm done with it, and I look around, and there is nowhere to put my trash. It happens all the time. And I know that a lot of motor coaches will have a trash can somewhere at the front, up near the driver's seat or something like that, but that's not always a great convenient place to put trash, especially if you are in the middle of a trip. So what do I end up doing? Well, sometimes I end up setting it on the seat beside me, hoping that everything goes well. Uh, There has been more than one time, though, where the coach has hit a bump or we've gone around a turn and that can that I thought was empty had a little bit of liquid left in it and it goes tipping over and spills all over the seat or all over my pants. Obviously, that's not a good look and it's not what you want. So my road tip for you today is if you're going to be traveling via coach, why don't you bring some trash bags for you and your travelers to use while you're on the motor coach? Now, trash bags uh, definitely don't have to be the big black trash bags that you put in your trash can at home. They could be something as simple as leftover plastic bags from the grocery store or even some of those much smaller little plastic bags that you might uh, use for a goodie bag at a kid's birthday party or something like that. 
if you bring some of those along, it gives you a super convenient way to deal with your trash. And I found that you can even kind of hang the bags from the little uh, tray table latch on the seat in front of you if it has that latch. Uh, or certainly you can hang it from an armrest or some other convenient place to put it. Or it even gives you an easy way to put something in the seat back pocket in front of you uh, without having to worry that uh, trash or paper might fall through the holes in the pocket or otherwise make a mess. Now, uh, I would certainly encourage you to bring along some trash bags for yourself. But if you're leading a group, I would even encourage you to bring a whole bunch of trash bags for the whole group. Now, I'm not saying that everybody in the group has to have their own trash bag, but even if you just spread some strategically throughout the coach, so maybe there's five or six different places for people to throw things away, it makes it so much more convenient and your travelers don't have to worry about what to do with their trash after they have that inevitable snack or drink on the bus. Uh, there are a few good reasons to do this. Number one, having one trash can at the front of the coach often isn't enough. It may not be enough to hold the trash that your group generates. And, and it's just a pain. It's just inconvenient, especially for the people seated all the way in the back of the coach to have to make their way up to the front of the coach. Having some other trash bags they can use keeps them in their seats, uh, which is always a good thing, especially while the coach is moving. And having trash bags available also encourages people to keep the coach tidy, and it cuts down on the work the driver has to do in cleaning up after your group, which drivers always appreciate. And finally, having some of those plastic bags on hand can be really helpful in all sorts of situations, not just when it comes to trash. Uh, if you have some wet clothes, if uh, there is a spill, if there is an item that you want to make sure stays wrapped up really securely, having some trash bags or some plastic bags in your carry-on on the coach can really get you out of a jam. So that is your travel tip of the week. Keep some trash bags on hand. You and your driver will be glad you did. Well, before we move on, I want to share a little bit of news from us. If you are a history buff, or if you have history buffs in your group, or travelers who are really interested in black history or the civil rights period in American history, we have just released a resource that you are going to love. Our annual U.S. Civil Rights Trail Travel Guide is out now, and uh, I have to say I think it is the best one we have ever done. If you don't know, the U.S. Civil Rights Trail is a collection of about 130 historic sites and museums and other similar sites all around the country where some of the most important moments and events and things from the civil rights movement took place and where travelers can have really deeply impactful travel experiences related to black history and civil rights. And the trail spans uh, all throughout the southern and eastern U.S., from Florida up to Washington, D.C., as far over as Kansas. Lots and lots of great places to explore. And our print magazine, the U.S. Civil Rights Trail Travel Guide, gives you practical on-the-ground itineraries that you can use to plan trips through six different regions of the South along the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. If you open this up, you are going to find itineraries that will show you uh, the cities that you must go to, the most important sites to visit while you're there, as well as some other cool attractions and activities to do along the way, and some great locally owned, black owned businesses, restaurants, organizations uh, that you can do business with while you're traveling in the area. Now, if you already subscribe to the group Travel Leader, Keep an eye out for the March issue of the magazine because the Civil Rights Trail Travel Guide is going to be included in that issue that you should be getting in your mailbox any day now. If you don't subscribe, don't worry. You can find the complete guide online on our website. Just go to grouptravelleader.com slash civil rights. That's all one word, civil rights. You can read every article from this year's Civil Rights Trail Guide as well as articles from like five previous years editions of the guide. So if you are into history, if you're interested in civil rights, if you think this would be a meaningful travel experience for your travelers, this is a resource you simply have to have. And did I mention it's free? That's right. It is absolutely free. Get yours now at grouptravelleader.com slash civil rights. 
Well, it's just about time for us to move into our featured conversation with Jeremy Sampson. Now, as we do that, I want to remind you, you don't need to worry about taking notes because I am taking notes for you. That's right. You can find a recap of some of the most important and helpful things that Jeremy had to say in the show notes for this episode, which you can find right below the media player in whatever app or website you are using to listen to this podcast. In those show notes as well, we will have links to some of the important things that Jeremy mentions and other resources that will help you out. After the conversation, I want to encourage you to hang around because I'm going to share some of my own thoughts around this important issue of the intersection between travel and sustainability. I don't think you're going to want to miss that. We will be right back with Jeremy Sampson. Atlantic City is ready to celebrate life's greatest moments with thrilling year-round events and attractions. With 24-hour gaming at nine casino resorts and stellar entertainment throughout, Atlantic City is sure to provide iconic celebrations. Historic, wooden, and more than five miles long, the Atlantic City Boardwalk attracts visitors from all around the world as they create their own waterfront memories. You can stroll the wooden way by foot, on a bicycle, or via the legendary rolling chair. Bask in the glowing sun, take a dip in the Atlantic Ocean, or stroll along the white sandy beaches to find the perfect seashell. At the famous and free beaches of Atlantic City, adventure is on the horizon. Known for its thriving culinary scene, Atlantic City welcomes all to explore its famous dining establishments. From celebrity chef hotspots to locally owned eateries, Atlantic City's restaurants are well-equipped to accommodate special events for large or small groups served in unique spaces. Start planning your Atlantic City trip at visitatlanticcity.com. All right, everybody. My guest today is a travel industry veteran whose career has taken him to six continents. After working in tour companies and in academia, he became involved with sustainability and advocacy work focusing on the intersection of tourism and climate. Today, he's the CEO of the Travel Foundation, an NGO that works in countries around the world, and he's one of the leaders of the Future of Travel Coalition. Jeremy Sampson, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Brian. It's great to be here. I am excited to have you here. We are talking all about climate and sustainability today. And out of the many, many voices in the industry uh, talking about this, you may have uh, one of the best resumes to talk about it in a credible way. So I was excited to to get some of your time to have a, an important conversation around that topic today. But before we get too deep into that issue, I'd love for our audience to hear a little bit about how you found yourself uh, involved in the tourism industry. Yeah. Um, well, I like to say that I tripped and fell and found myself in my job. <laughs> um, cause I, I can't say that it was, it was, um, you know, incredibly intentional. Um, I did actually start out my career in the industry. Um, uh, when I was in, uh, college in, in, uh, the late nineties, I went to school at Berkeley and wanted to be a journalist and I'd wanted to be a journalist since I was about eight years old. And all of a sudden had a, my first uh, midlife crisis at 22 when I graduated <laughs> school and realized I had no interest in being a journalist anymore. Mm. Um, I flipped through the classified ads because that's what we did back then <laughs> and, uh, and found myself a job at a travel agency. Um, it turned out to be one of the oldest and most respected travel agencies in San Francisco on Market Street. It was an interesting time uh, for me and, and just a, a big learning experience. Um, I left there uh, in... 1999, I think it was, and and maybe 2000, and traveled a bit. I moved to Brazil for a year just to teach English and have fun mostly. Um, worked in the education industry when I came back for a while. And uh, in 2011, moved to Portland, Oregon, and again, was just sort of looking for my next step. Um, there I found uh, a classified ad, except this time I think it was on Craigslist. <laughs> we'd moved, <laughs> we'd evolved since, uh, since the late 90s. Yeah. Um, for Sustainable Travel International, it appealed to me right away, this, this uh, opportunity, and, uh, and I thought it could be a good mix with my, my experience. They were looking for someone at the time to, to simply to redo their website. It was a six-month kind of marketing, part-time marketing contract. 
I had done websites and, and a lot of communication stuff over the years. I knew I loved travel and was interested in getting back in the industry. I didn't know anything about sustainability. It's not a, it's not, I mean, I had the values, uh, but I didn't have the lexicon, let's say, to, mm. to really understand the systems thinking behind it. And, um, and I applied for this, this role and, and, uh, and, you know, got the opportunity. Um, it was a big learning experience for me from, from the get go. So I stayed there six months in that contract job and, and eventually I moved into a full-time role, uh, where, which, um, ended up being a five-year, uh, five-year role that I grew into vice president of partnerships, um, and, and operations, um, at SCI. Um, it was an amazing journey that I, I left in, in 2014. I took some time during that period to, um, to consult and, and work with a couple of, of small businesses. Probably one of the best things I did actually during that period was run a tour operator business, which helped me get back into the sort of in the weeds and, and, and remember what life is like on the margins. It's, it's really easy to sit here and pontificate about what people should do. It's yeah. quite an effort to try to do it on a mm. day-to-day basis. And that's something I really do appreciate. Um, I never thought I'd get back into to travel. I mean, I never thought I'd get back into the nonprofit space. But in um, 2019, I was living in Spain, working for IUCN, which is a conservation organization developing um, tourism and protected area projects with the European Union funding. And, um, and got uh, recruited to come interview for the role of the Travel Foundation, which is an organization I've long admired. And I read the job description and I just thought, okay, I, I have to give this a shot. It, it basically describes me. Um, it felt like it was the right time, the right move. And so I joined the organization in 2019. It's been four and a half years and no intention of stopping anytime soon. So uh, you guys are very focused on uh, sort of the intersection of uh, sustainability and travel, as I, I mentioned earlier. How do you approach that conversation? Because uh, it's a difficult conversation no matter how you come at it. But there, there are a lot of people in the sustainability world who would you know, say, well, we don't really need travel. Just quit it. And then, you know, people in the travel world saying, hold on, (laughs) wait a minute, let's talk about this. So can you give us, uh, with a foot in both of those worlds, can you give us a perspective on how we can maybe start to find our way into those conversations without it seeming, you know, so high stakes? Yeah, I I think it's a great question. I I think about this a lot. Um, First of all, I think that a bit of empathy is required, Um, you know, understanding where, where people might be coming from, you know, I think we need to understand each other and, and where and, and I think where the where organizations have not quite succeeded in the past in, in moving this message along is not necessarily understanding the day-to-day motivations, you know, incentive and behavior of of industry uh, professionals, you know, it because uh it's it's not necessarily that people don't care or they don't want to change things. It's it's often that they don't necessarily know how, mm-hmm. or they're being they're being driven by um, outside influence or outside information um, that uh, that helps drive the agenda of, of the work that they're doing. And and we need to be able to to find the common point for for that agenda. So I have an agenda. You have an agenda. Someone else has an agenda and where does that, where's the Venn diagram, you know, mm. for that agenda uh, really sit? I think that's super important. It's, it's good to reflect that, um, you know, we, we're an industry funded organization from the get go. Um, and we, for a long time were, because most of our funding was coming from industry and, and at, at the time UK outbound companies. So our initial funders were the likes of Tui, Thomas Cook, Virgin Holidays, Sunville Holidays. Um, and for a long time, we tried to represent, uh, their interests, um, you know, as, as, a, as, as their members and, and, and core funders. When we did an analysis a couple of years ago, we looked at the landscape and we realized that, um, you know, there were enough organizations that were, um, that were trying to represent industry interests. There are a lot of associations, um, there, you know, there are a plethora of associations representing industry interests. Um, there are, there are a number of organizations representing government interests, representing sort of the, the government, you know, lobby for, um, tourism dollars, you know, essentially, but there aren't, yeah, there weren't really organizations that were, um, trying to reflect and represent 
the other stakeholder in this in this conversation, which is com- the communities that we operate in and the environment that the, and the resources that we depend on. And so we started shifting our thinking um, to making you know communities and and the environment, and climate, our our primary stakeholders, and advocating for their piece of the of the pie. And that doesn't mean that that's the only piece of the conversation. It just means it's a part that absolutely needs to be better represented. I think where we found the most success, though, is is in is in just being truthful. <laughs> and I don't just mean not lying. I mean being as truthful as possible. So looking at at the whole picture of a conversation, you know, it's so. For example, um, the industry has done a great job of representing its economic impact. You know, over the years, there's been all these campaigns. Tourism is a force for good, and and actually, lots of progress has been made in tourism being recognized as a key economic sector. But that conversation isn't fully truthful unless you look at the other impact that tourism brings to the table and and create some balance because people aren't aren't naive. <laughs> so on the one hand, you have a you have the economic impact. Right, there's a lot of positives. You also have some um, some negative impacts or some challenges that that come along with that. And if you can look at the whole picture and and talk in an honest way about what what it is that could make um, could make the situation more of a net positive, then I think we're onto something. But if 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 the focus is is overly in one area without while just sort of ignoring or burying our heads in the sand about the other piece, then I, I think it's a real problem. I just think by having a little bit more nuance in these conversations and 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 people like to say, oh, you're you are you say things that are so provocative. I don't really think I'm I'm all that provocative or radical. What we're saying is is just trying to to uh trying to say some things that are that aren't often said because everyone is worried about their, you know, who who is funding them or yeah. what to be scared of. And we thought the same. Our board was scared of of the decision to focus more on climate change who will ever fund us <laughs> but we thought well this is the right thing to do and and this is happening whether people like it or not so we might as well start to pay attention and see if we can provide some leadership yeah so in that direction you guys have uh, recently completed uh, an ambitious project envisioning tourism in 2030 and beyond uh give us the high level view of what you were hoping to do when you set out on that project, what the findings were and uh, what sort of, you know, map you're proposing to the travel industry to, you know, make it to 2030 in uh, a way that is as sustainable uh, as possible. Yeah. The first thing we were trying to accomplish is to have a conversation uh, with the industry about what's happening here and what it is that we need to advocate for. Um, And, you know, again, my perspective on this, and I think the the report and lots of data proves this out. Change is already here. Um, you know, the paradigm is shifting, and I think that you have a couple of choices. Really, you can again bury your head in the sand and pretend and la 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 la, <laughs> or you know, you can you can start to be proactive about it because what's coming if you if you aren't proactive about it is probably not, not going to be all that awesome. You know, I think that we're headed towards more regulation. I think that there could be futures where um where there are more restrictions put in place uh, as we as we saw during covid. I'm not saying that any of those will definitely happen, but I'm saying I I would if I was running a company right now, I would like to be aware of those risks and those possibilities and perhaps stay out ahead of it. And I like to I like to ask people, if you knew that covid was coming, and you had a couple of years to prepare for it. It was still going to be exactly what it was, but you could have prepared. What might you have done differently? I think that there's been an intentional um, decision in a way to not pay attention to it because it's quite scary um, and quite existential for the industry. But we also know that the industry, like the industry shutting down and, and um, you know, removing itself as an economic engine is also not a great option. So, so we're in a bit of a bind here. And the, the only way forward is to, is to think about how to adapt and evolve. Um, and so we'd like that, we'd like the conversation to shift into that mode. The second thing that we really wanted to do here was explore the compatibility between industry growth and um, climate targets. So why is that? Well, in 2021, we were co-authors of the Glasgow Declaration on Climate Action and Tourism, which we've been advocating for since um, since day one. 
Uh, the idea there was to create an aligned industry framework and space for collaboration on climate change, um, the scale of which requires collaboration and alignment. I mean, you and me and and Bob over here all doing our part is fine. It's great, but it's not enough. We know that we need kind of a scaled response and we need that response to be fair and equitable because you and me and Bob may not have the same responsibility as a big hotel chain or a, or an airline, which has, you know, which has a, a larger scale um, certainly a larger scale business, but also a larger stake in the, um, in the situation here. So what we're trying to do is, is study how can, how can the industry align itself with those targets and at the same time, um, remain on a growth trajectory. Number one, because that's what the industry wants to hear <laughs> that, that we know that the doom and gloom doesn't necessarily work. Number two, because growth is an imperative. The industry is one of the best, um, you know, economic engines for sustainable development if it's done correctly. Um, the alternative to to for many in economies is actually going back to extractive industry, mm. um, which was, tourism was presented as a solution to. So that's not a great option. And number three was to discuss how we could be more equitable about this conversation because again. Um, it's a bit like how long is a ball of string or whatever, you know, whatever the, that analogy is. But, you know, uh, if, if, if all of a sudden, for example, you know, the Caribbean, which is the, one of the world's most tourism dependent, um, economic regions, if all of a sudden us in the global North decided to just not fly anymore because it wasn't because we'd polluted too much and we stopped going to the Caribbean, that doesn't sound like a great option for anyone, you know, right, right. But, but particularly who's abandoned there is the Caribbean and, and those and those island economies and the people who contributed very little to to um, uh, the climate, uh, to the climate emergency in the first place. So what we also wanted to do was start a conversation about what do we do about that? You know, how do we make this more equitable, equitable so it doesn't become yet another situation where. Um, you know, where, where we've um, what, maybe in, unintentionally, but created more inequities in our system. Right. Um, and to do that, we need to have a global conversation about what to do here. I, do, I don't have the answers, but I know we need to bring people into alignment to have that discussion. Um, so those were the objectives of the of the research. Um, we got together a research team and an industry. Uh, we, we like to do an industry perspective team as part of our research. So what that looks like is we've got research from academics who are, which is robust and and you know uh, um, trustworthy in, in in its in its source. Um, and then we've got a team of of perspective, um, you know, uh, a team of, of perspective folks. Who are there to um, do the analysis alongside us to give their perspective because I might look at it one way, but our partners in Chile might look at it another way and say, well, actually, <laughs> the right. way we see this is quite different. So we gather industry perspectives um, and we use that industry perspective to refine the, the narrative that ultimately comes out in the report. So what we were able to find when we looked at the compatibility, we were hoping to find various scenarios in which the industry could continue to grow and achieve the, the climate targets set out by Glasgow and Paris. And ultimately, it was a little scary because we spent all day looking for scenarios and we <laughs> couldn't find any until we found one. And it, it, is a, it, is a, it is positive news in the one sense because we found a scenario that, that could work. Um, it is a business as usual growth trajectory for the most part, but it does come with some pain points and some, you know, I think things to recognize. Is this exactly how things are going to play out? I mean, probably not. <laughs> you know, we don't we don't exactly know the um, effect that technology is going to have on on these scenarios. AI is obviously here to help or hinder. But I guess we're not sure yet. Yeah. Um, but I think the. And what we what we found was that the industry can. I think the neat thing about tourism actually is that growth can look lots of different ways. And and um, what we did find is that we would have to limit. There would have to be some limitations first of all in order to achieve those targets. The main one, the main headline being that um, long haul travel. So um, anything you know, anything above a couple hours uh, of flying is considered long long distance travel. Long haul travel would not have to go away, or you know, be be uh, be cut, cut significantly, but growth would have to be um, uh, limited from 2019 levels for a little while until the industry caught up um, on its on its capabilities of decarbonization. So eventually, the airline industry will decarbonize. It's just that we can't do that now. We can't even fuel 
the, all the planes flying around for one day um, right. with the existence of the sustainable aviation fuel. So there's, there's obviously work to do to catch up. Um, this is just the reality of the situation. It's hard to abate and it will take some time. Um, that doesn't mean that forever and ever no one can fly again. It just means we need to buy time. Um, secondly, so, you know, this would mean sh a shift, you know, though, in, in how people travel. If, if there was a if there was a bit of a limit placed on long haul, that might mean that. And, and because of that, we would we would anticipate um, the pricing prices to get very expensive um, and that for that to be felt at the, you know, sort of on the consumer end. So that's going to push people to short short haul travel, traveling by uh, rail, traveling by um, electric vehicle, traveling by electric coach, which is something that's happening and isn't quite there yet, but is coming. So a lot of the rest of the industry and from a transportation perspective and an accommodation perspective is ready to decarbonize at scale. And, and we're, we're actually on the pathway to doing that. So a lot of this trajectory in which um, travel can continue to grow, uh, but also we get to a more sustainable future. A lot of it relies on um, an optimism that aviation can become sustainable. Uh, you mentioned, you know, the sustainable aviation fuels. They've been proven in theory. Can they work at scale? Absolutely not today. What What is your sort of prediction for the pathway of that technology or some other kind of technology that is going to, you know, solve this problem of emissions happening every time you fly? Yeah, I, I think that the, that the airline industry will figure that out. Um, I... And, and I think I happen to be a bit of an optimist about, and I have to be in my job, otherwise I would sort of crumble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, I, I happen to believe that AI came out at just the right time because what, what's needed is um, scale and speed, mm. um, right? So uh, that is not something I don't, I even think our human brains can comprehend <laughs> the scale and speed that are necessary. That's why we've got not far enough, but AI um, is able to take that knowledge and and scale it and 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 you know even the way it just responds to things so quickly, um, and so I I happen to think that it's just the right timing for that some of these things to actually be figured out by by the by the mach our new machine friends, um, and and um, I, I don't know I'm I'm not an expert from a technical standpoint by any means I just happen to think that. Um, the, and scientists will say, we, we know what has to be done. We just don't know how to do it. Like at the, the scale is just beyond our, our, our current capacity. Um, so I, I think that this will, I think this will be disruptive in, in that way. I also think if I'm, if I'm, if I'm honest, I, I don't think the airline industry has put its all into this and, and it's a bit frustrating. And there's a lot of, you know, and, and, and I, I think it's important to hold the airline industry to account on this a little bit. Um, because they, they're, the response is often like, well, we're doing what we can. And, and I think there might be some truth to that, but there's also, I think we can say with, with fairness that there hasn't been the efforts that we, you know, that we might have expected, um, from the industry to, to rapidly, um, to rapidly scale some of these solutions. And, and there was such a long, fo long focus on carbon offsetting and that sort of thing, which, you know, I just think, uh, you know, as part of a broader recipe of investment and financing, and the solutions that we need by all means, but as a, as a, as a way to demonstrate that we're doing something while, while taking a back seat to this conversation, I, I don't buy it. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think it's important that, that the airline industry be held to account and come to the table as part of this broader conversation about where we go from here. Um, a lot of times it, uh, the air, the airline industry, same thing with crews to some extent. They, they they separate themselves as transportation and not and not necessarily um, engage in the tourism sector conversation. And what we'd like to do is build more bridges because I think you know it's not any one airline's responsibility, just as it isn't any one company's responsibility. We just need to have a joined up thinking here about how we're going to achieve you know these. Um, these ambitious um, targets and these ambitious goals and and continue to thrive because I think that's what everyone wants. Yeah. So um, you have run tour companies, so you can very easily put yourself in the place of that small to mid-sized tour company owner, maybe solopreneur. If they are hearing you, they are sympathetic to the cause. They want to be part of this journey to uh, towards you know sustainability and growth. What would you tell that person that they could do 
uh, feasibly in 2024 that is going to contribute in a meaningful way uh, that also is not going to completely disrupt the way they run their business or the way their customers experience their product? Yeah, lots of stuff to think about here. Number one, I'm of kind of of two minds in, in some sense. I I do believe that small operators, individuals, travelers, you know, sort of everyone in the system should play a role. And I think it's unfair to um, pin all the the um, all of the responsibility or the you know a significant chunk of responsibility onto the small suppliers that are the beating heart of this industry. Mm-hmm. So I think for quite a long time that's actually been unfortunately the case. You know, most of the most of the larger companies have actually demonstrated their sustainability credentials by um, having their supply chain respond to c- questionnaires and giving them data and holding them to account and holding contracts over their head if they don't mm. um, comply and that sort of thing. I think that's a really unfair, un- inequitable system and one of the biggest challenges in our industry. And and um, you know, with OTAs coming out and sort of essentially squeeze, you know, squeezing the margins there. It's tough. And that's why I always say life on the margins. And what, you know, there's just only so much time and resource that you can put into this, even if your heart is there. So I, I want to say that because I, I think it is important to recognize that we hold, we not hold everyone to the same standard. I, I just don't think that's right. But by the same token, I do think that everyone does have a role to play, an equitable role to play. And there are things that businesses can do Businesses can certainly be a part of um, particularly uh, behavior change. You know, they're the ones closest to the ground and they're the ones offering, you know, offering and implementing the product at the end of the day. And what we found when we've gone into destinations is that operators are particularly sometimes get demotivated by the climate conversation because of, well, what, what can I do? And is it just punitive or expensive? But when you flip it around and you create opportunities for them to not only create efficiency within their business, which is nice operationally and cost of, you know, cost savings, that sort of thing, but, but playing a role in um, essentially designing unsustainable options right out of the system. Mm. Um, I, I give this example a lot, but I think it really illustrates it nicely. You know, from a behavior change perspective, there are thousands of things that, that um, companies can do to, uh, to encourage um, or, or simply, um, you know, not make available the, the, uh, unsustainable options or to encourage more sustainable choice. Um, one of the, one of the obvious ones, you know, you take a menu and you put the vegetarian special, I'm sorry, the uh, vegetarian uh, dish as the chef special hmm. for the day and, and uptake increases by something like 80% on that dish. And that's just a small example of number one of how humans are a little bit predictable and <laughs> and, uh, and easy to manipulate. But secondly, you know, uh, actually one of the best ways for a restaurant to participate in this whole conversation is to help reduce meat consumption. Now, uh, there is some percentage, I don't know if it's 50%, it's probably less than that, but there's some percentage, let's say, of our audience in the U.S. or travelers in the U.S., who, because of where they sit in the country, on the political spectrum, in the culture wars just completely tune out as soon as they hear some of these buzzwords, yeah, uh, sustainability, uh, you know, equitability, that sort of thing. How do you propose that our industry make some of these meaningful moves forward with the understanding that let's say half the world uh, disagrees or doesn't think it's that big a deal or isn't willing to make sacrifice? I mean, is it, is this all just sort of a, a pipe dream given the political reality on the ground or are there some, real meaningful ways forward where we're not fighting with each other and we're actually, you know, making good progress. First of all, I mean, Brian, you said 50% of the world, but let's be honest, it's it's not 50% of the world. It's mm-hmm. it's um and it's not even 50% of the US. It is 50% of a uh, of the voting population perhaps. Um you know, in the US, which is which is unfortunately not very large. So right. it is again a loud a loud minority and I think it's you know it's it's sort of less than 50% too. Um but 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 sure, you know, the taking you taking that at face value and and recognizing that politics plays a role in in the way that decisions are made and and the way that leaders are communicating and 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 um and the willingness to sort of bring up issues. I think that at the end of the day, 
the the initial gut reaction to climate or and, and this is happening in the DEI space too. All of a sudden everyone is too woke and all these things. I mean, um, I believe at the end of the day that actually there is a real shared agenda um, for change and that the terminology is what trips people up. So um, when it comes to climate, uh, when it comes to uh, transitioning the tourism economy in a climate change paradigm, let's say a climate emergency paradigm, what are some of the solutions? Well, mostly it is to make the industry, um, you know, much more local. So less dependent on, on um, unnecessary resources, less dependent on big supply chains and, and the sort of tourism industrial complex and more, more investment in local opportunities and local infrastructure. Um, it also, you know, it also means um, creating new, you know, new product and shifting the way that the industry promotes itself, maybe away from a sun, sand and sea uh, package dominated um, experience to, um, you know, a, a slower, um, a slower uh, uh, experience where people are spending more money along the way and spreading out their visits. And, and, and not that, and, you know, not that sun, sand, and sea is ever going to go away, but um, but it's just maybe shifting the the percentage that's on offer so that you know more people are can experience those longer, slower trips where where they're actually spending more money and time in a place and a, and getting to have that meaningful exchange. So in in essence, um, and then when it comes to to destination level stuff, and I have a really nice example. I, I can't say exactly where this happened, but it was in it was in the U.S. Um, and there was a destination which uh, had uh, put forward a climate action plan um, to stakeholders, which was sort of roundly booed um, at the at the first presentation, and primarily because of politics, because it had the words climate change all over it. Um, it was presented again a month later with the words resilience replacing climate change, and it mm. passed unanimously. Mm. And the Crazy thing was that very little changed inside the plan. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I think that that goes to show you kind of where, where people are at with the terminology. But the things that were inside were, you know, infrastructure investments, um, reducing traffic, you know, because it because it is creating, uh, you know, it's creating more emissions and creating a bad experience for, for tourism um, and then investing in local business. So who wouldn't want those things? I mean, it, it's really hard. You know, it's really hard to to argue with any of those things, particularly at, at local level, where um, there is a con- there is a desire, of course, for like local investment and improving people's lives. Yeah. Uh, before I let you go, what is the best way for people to follow you or your work at the Travel Foundation and learn more about it? Sure. Um, well, uh, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, so um, please feel free to connect with me there. Um, so is the organization, the Travel Foundation. We use that as our primary source of, um, you know, outreach. Um, I would also suggest, uh, yeah, you can certainly have a look at our website. Um, and for those that are interested in resources like the Glasgow Declaration, um, there is a separate website for that on the UNWTO platform, um, which has information about becoming a signatory as well as lots of resources for um, organizations that are, you know, sort of anywhere in this journey. You know, I, I myself was scared just to talk about this because I don't have the training. I'm not like a climate change expert by any means. And it took me a year, year and a half of us working on this to build the confidence to start saying stuff in public. And now I'm positioned as this climate change, you know, the, one of the <laughs> leaders of the climate movement and tourism. But, you know, it didn't it wasn't a huge investment, let's say it, it was it was just some time and and thought to really let it sink in and understand how these things apply to our day to day. Um, and that's what I encourage the industry to do is not to run scared from it, but let's take a look at, you know, take a look at these issues and try to understand them and apply them as a lens for your day to day thinking. Um, and, and there, there's where we're going to start to see real change. Mm, yeah. I love that. Well, before I let you go, we have some uh, final questions we ask everybody and these are just for fun. So you can answer off the top of your head. Uh, when you book travel, are you selecting a window seat or an aisle seat? Always aisle. Yeah. Got to get up as much as possible. <laughs> I hear that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's one thing in your carry on that you wouldn't travel without? Um, huh. In my carry on, um, probably my laptop because I'm always working. <laughs> uh, so if you had a free airline or rail or bus pass or something like that and a week with nothing else to do, where would you head next? Ecuador. Mm. Why is that? 
Uh, never been. It's been really high on my list. I was supposed to go for my 40th birthday and instead I went to Seattle, which was, <laughs> was not much of a journey <laughs> just for things going on. But I've always been really um, intrigued by Ecuador and the opportunity to see the Andes and the Galapagos, um, mm. you know, in one sort of in one uh, in one experience. So that's really high on my list. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so last question is what's something you have seen or done on the road that you wish you could go back and experience again with somebody you love? Um, so probably my favorite travel experience ever was, um, getting up really, really early in the morning to, um, hike the, um, the big dunes in the Namib desert at Salsa's flight. Um, which I got to do back in 2012, got up early in the morning as part of that experience and, um, climbed up this huge dune, um, at sunrise and, um, and then got to run down it into the, you know, into the desert um, landscape. And it's just one of the most amazing, um, experiences I've, I've ever gotten to have and it's completely different ecosystem. And there was something really special about doing it really early in the day and just having, having that be a way to, to start, um, to start my day. It always sticks in my mind and my wife wasn't there, unfortunately. And my kid, you know, my kids didn't exist yet, but yeah. it's something I would just love to go back and do again and let them have the same experience of, of, uh, you know, just, just something that felt really, really good and, and, and really distinct about, about a place is something that I couldn't even imagine doing anywhere here, you know, here close to home. So it just, yeah. Yeah, it just really stands out in my mind. Ah, that's amazing. Jeremy Sampson, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Jeremy Sampson. I hope you got some good ideas and even some inspiration from the things he had to say and the way he thinks about tourism's role in sustainability. Now, I want to recap a few of what I think are the most important ideas he shared just to make sure you don't miss them. When we were talking about sustainability in travel and how we discuss that with people, he said, a bit of empathy is required. Understanding where people might be coming from. We need to understand each other. And where organizations haven't quite succeeded in the past, moving this message along is not necessarily understanding day-to-day -day motivations, incentive, and behavior of industry professionals. He said, it's not that people don't care, it's they don't necessarily know how. And we need to be able to find the common points in our agendas. I think this is such an important perspective because, well, climate is such a touchy issue and there are so many stakeholders with different incentives and motivations and all too often in tourism and outside of tourism when people discuss climate issues they do so from a very ideological point of view sometimes a very political point of view definitely a polarized point of view and it makes it difficult for any meaningful discussion to actually take place let alone any meaningful change to actually get done so Approaching these conversations with empathy is hugely important, and I commend Jeremy for starting from that perspective. Now, when we were talking about what smaller companies and organizations can do to make meaningful steps toward sustainability and travel, Jeremy said, I believe everyone should play a role, and I believe it's unfair to pin a significant chunk of the responsibility on small suppliers. But I think it's important to recognize that we not hold everyone to the same standard. And he went on to say, businesses can be part of behavior change. They're the ones closest to the ground. When you give them opportunities to play a role in designing unsustainable options right out of the system, there are thousands of things companies can do to encourage more sustainable choices. I love this perspective and this approach because it is just so balanced on the one hand for all of us that are in small companies or, or maybe you're a mom and pop or a solopreneur, there is only so much that you can do to really impact uh, the carbon footprint and the sustainability of the travel that you do and your customers do. And asking small organizations to shoulder the brunt of the burden or to significantly raise their prices in a way that is going to diminish their profitability. Well, it's just not fair and it's just never going to happen. 
But I love this, uh, this dual approach of saying, Hey, we're not going to pin a lot of stuff on small organizations, but there are some strategic things small organizations can do. And so rather than get bogged down in how hard this may seem or how big the problem may seem, I think a great thing for a small organization to do is just ask those questions about, Hey, what can I do in the way I'm designing tours or the options I'm giving customers that makes sustainability the default instead of a big special ask or a box they have to check. And finally, when we were talking about how to navigate sustainability issues in an environment full of political division, Jeremy said, I believe at the end of the day, there's actually a real shared agenda for change. And it's the terminology that trips people up. When it comes to transitioning the tourism economy in a climate change paradigm, what are some of the solutions? Mostly it's to make the industry much more local, less dependent on big supply chains, more investment in local opportunities and local infrastructure. It also means creating new product and new ways for the industry to promote itself. Man, what a breath of fresh air that is. And what a great insight at the end of the day, nobody wants to see the planet trashed. And at the end of the day, nobody, or at least nobody who's reasonable wants to see tourism go away and nobody wants to see small organizations put out of business. What we want to see is a way to make sure all these things continue to thrive in the future and are available for generations to come. And that can actually benefit organizations and benefit communities. So I love this uh, way of thinking of saying, let's get around the politically charged terminology. Let's stop using loaded words and let's just talk about our shared interests and how we can collaborate to move forward in a way that is going to be great for everybody. Wonderful insight there from Jeremy Sampson. Well, before we go, I want to take just a minute and give you a couple of my own thoughts on uh, this really big topic of sustainability and travel. You know, I had been wanting to do an episode on this subject for almost two years now, and we just haven't because I had not yet found the right person to talk to about it. Uh, but I heard Jeremy speak at a conference last fall. I loved his perspective and loved what he had to say and knew that he was the person to dive into this topic with. And I want to share a couple of reasons why I appreciate Jeremy's work and the Travel Foundation's work. One of them is that regardless of what you think of climate and sustainability, this is a serious issue for all of us and it's not going away. Uh, if you think climate change is the biggest threat to humanity, well, there are people out there that think that uh, throttling small business and making business harder to do is a much bigger threat than climate change. And that perspective isn't going away. Similarly, if you don't consider climate a very big deal, I understand that point of view, but there are many, many, many people out there that think climate change is a huge issue and they are not going away either. This issue isn't going away no matter what you think about it. And so rather than just draw battle lines and take sides, I think it's important to engage with the issue and even engage with people that come at it from a completely different perspective, maybe a perspective you don't agree with. And that's why it's so important to have these conversations with people like Jeremy. Another thing I appreciate is that Jeremy and the Travel Foundation are engaging in sustainability discussions with the interests of the tourism industry in mind. And this is really important. You know, there are lots of other people out there that talk about climate and sustainability, and some of them honestly couldn't care less what happens to us. I have seen more than one proposal that basically calls for travel, especially leisure travel, to stop altogether. Now, I don't need to tell you why I think that's a bad idea. You know, there's an old saying, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And so I appreciate Jeremy and the Travel Foundation finding a spot at the table for the tourism industry getting involved in these discussions and representing our interests and doing it well. And finally, in a world with so much empty talk around sustainability, the Travel Foundation has actually put forward a proposal with real practical recommendations. That's the Envision 2030 report that Jeremy referenced. And uh, you don't have to like everything in that report. In fact, I'll be honest, I don't like everything in that report. I don't like all their proposals or some of their proposals. 
but I appreciate Jeremy and his team being willing to put a proposal on the table and give our industry a starting point for discussion because I'm not sure if you've noticed, but many, many other people in the sustainability space never actually make a practical recommendation. The Travel Foundation has, and I commend them for it. Anyway, enough about what I think. I would love to hear what you think about tourism and sustainability or any other issue impacting travel today. You can reach me at podcast at grouptravelleader.com. I read every email that comes into that address. I so enjoy hearing from you. And hey, you never know, your thoughts and ideas might just be part of a future episode of Gather and Go. And hey, while you're in the mood to give us some feedback, would you do me a big favor? Would you go to your favorite podcasting app? And if you haven't already, subscribe to the show and then leave us a review. Give us a rating. Those are all super helpful. And I am so thankful to all of you who have done that so far. My thanks as well to Jeremy Sampson for joining us today on the next episode of Gather and Go. We're going to have a fascinating conversation with travel researchers Danny Guerrero and Ezra Calvert about the future of travel's next generation and how they are different and similar to the travelers we're serving now. It's going to be a fascinating conversation. You won't want to miss that one. Until then, though, remember this. At the end of the day, we are all on this trip together. So let's make it a good one. See you next time on Gather and Go. Gather and Go is hosted and executive produced by me, Brian Jewell. Our publisher is Mac Lacey. Danya Simmons is our creative director. Ashley Ricks is our circulation manager and graphic designer. Our sales team is Kyle Anderson and Bryce Wilson. To advertise on the podcast, call Kyle or Bryce at 859-253-0455. Gather and Go is a production of the Group Travel Leader. For more information on our podcast, magazines, and events, visit us online at grouptravelleader.com. This episode was sponsored by Visit Atlantic City. This vibrant city awaits your arrival, and the knowledgeable staff is on hand to assist you with everything you need to make your group visit a success. Learn more at visitatlanticcity.com.